Hey everyone, my name is Casey and uh, thanks for joining us. This is our 10 minute recap of Sunday's message. So please do not take this brevity of uh, handling this topic in this 10 minutes as being insensitive to where you might be. Some of you totally disagree with the biblical perspective on sex and sexuality and some of you, um, you know, you bring in a lot of pain and hurt and shame uh, from either choices maybe you've made or that have been made toward you. And I just want to let you know that like, we value that. And um, this is just to begin the dialogue. The greatest gift to us would be able to be in a relationship with you where we could um, lovingly uh, hear where you are, value where you are, listen, and then uh, hopefully have the opportunity to point you uh, to Jesus. So hopefully this is the beginning of, of, of that. So let me hop in. What about God and sex? We're in the middle of this series where we're taking a look at what does God say about particular topics that seem pretty relevant. Um, to our, our day and age, and uh, the, where I want to start here is what have we been famous for as a church throughout the years? I'm not talking about the Avenue Church, I'm just talking about the church in general. I think we've been famous for a few things. I think we're uh, sometimes more famous for what we're against than for what we're for. I think we're sometimes famous for not talking about this issue at all, um, even in our homes. Uh, I think we're famous for uh, failure. And it seems like, especially in leadership, there's been a lot of failure. And so as one who represents leadership, may I apologize uh, for that uh, collective failure, ask your forgiveness, and um, uh, I have great hope that that narrative is gonna be rewritten uh, through what God's doing. And uh, yeah, and, and I think that uh, we're also uh, at times uh, pretty famous for elevating this area over other areas. Like we're ready to fire and shoot uh, in this area, but then we're, we're slow to hold somebody accountable maybe in another area. So maybe that's, that's your uh, experience, maybe not, but uh, it seems kind of like what, uh, where, where some people may, may have been. And so what does the scriptures have to say? What does God have to say about sex? Um, here we wanted to launch into Genesis 1, it's kind of an anchor verse that says that God made um, men and women in his own image, which means that we're supposed to be like him. If, if somebody's in, in the image of somebody else, they're like him that person and in this case our lives are supposed to be like god and resemble um, who god is and uh, and so um, but in this particular portion of it he not only makes them in his image but then he blesses them it's like he gives them his favor a piece of his heart and the very first thing he tells them to do after they're blessed is go have sex be fruitful and multiply I think that's awesome. I mean, like, from the get-go, let's just understand that God loves sex. Like, he's a big fan of it, and he uh, deeply desires for us to enjoy it in the context and uh, under the, the, the usages that he gives for it. He's the giver of it, and, uh, and he, he wants us to enjoy it. And um, here's, here's kind of uh, where, where we launch into some of the application of this. Um, sex is a gift from the heart of God about the heart of God. So as we um, are exploring sex, we should be exploring the heart of God. Like we should be learning more and more about the giver of this good gift. And let me just uh, say that um, as, we, as we see in all of life, all of life points to Jesus. And when God gives us good gifts, they're to point to the better gift of Jesus. And sex is no exception. Like when we are enjoying sex, and uh, engaging in it in the way that God's designed, it's actually supposed to lead us to Jesus. It actually um, is a way where we can worship Jesus as we are um, experiencing some of the things that sex has for us. It reminds us that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those things. So let's check that out. Uh, first of all, it gives us the gift of procreation we see in Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply. And so God was you know, pretty specific. This is how humanity is going to continue and be sustained. The gift of intimacy. The man and his wife were naked and they were not ashamed. And, and so what I love about this is um, this, this gives us the context uh, under which marriage, uh, under which sex is to be uh, enjoyed. It's between a man, it's between a woman, and it's in the context of a marriage. And this was the first marriage right here. It's, this is the passage that uh, reads, um, you know, for this reason, a man leaves his, his mother and father and joins his wife and the two become one. And so in that, we're given the context 
under which, the only context under which sex is to be um, experienced and enjoyed, and we're also given the fact that it has another ramification besides just for, you know, making babies, it is for enjoying intimacy. And so from these two things, we see that, that God is the God of life, as we, as we see babies being born, we also see that God is the God of intimacy. That between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, there's this beautiful intimacy. And when we enjoy sex in the context in which God has given it, we actually are reminded of that intimacy. We enjoy it with our spouse, and it reminds us and points us to that greater divine intimacy. How beautiful is that? That they were naked and not ashamed. It's like they were fully known and fully loved. Um, gift of pleasure, uh, we see in the, in the book of Song of Solomon that it's meant to be pleasurable and so that sex in its uh, proper context is supposed to be something that's pleasurable both for you and uh, your spouse. And, and, um, and, and so you see that it's not just about your pleasure, but it's about um, their pleasure as well. And we learn that we're, we serve a God of pleasure and that our greatest delight is found, our greatest pleasure is found in Jesus. And it's also a gift of protection. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, man, don't deprive one another except for maybe a season of prayer and fasting and things like that. Um, but then come back together so that you're not tempted. Uh, and, and he's like, man, like, like the battle's real. And, and sex is given as a gift of protecting uh, one another uh, in, in this proper context. And so uh, this is kind of where we get into like, um, as we dive deeper, God's way versus our way. God's way is like, this is how God rolls. He's like, he gives us good gifts that are all supposed to point to the better gift of Jesus. So whether it's food, music, sex, as we enjoy that in God's context, it reminds us and it points us to Jesus. It actually helps us to worship Jesus. Our way, though, is to take those, those good gifts and make them try to fulfill us. And so rather than getting Jesus, we get an idol. We get a lot of brokenness. And we see that brokenness um, in, in our world today is, is definitely evident. We see it, you know, where, where life is supposed to be created and things like that. Um, we see abortions and, and we, we see on the opposite side of abortions, we see, um, you know, children that come into a marriage and then seem to rob the marriage of its passion and romance and intimacy. Uh, we see distortions of intimacy where people are looking for intimacy in, in like all the wrong places and uh, or they become like codependent and super needy on a person uh, rather than on the person of Jesus. And uh, we see pleasure. Uh, this is one where we see a big distortion here, and, and it kind of falls under all of them, but the distortion of pornography, where we see that industry both killing the people who are involved in it and also killing marriages and, and, and what God intended for sex. Is, is it just distorts expectation, and it, it like dehumanizes uh, what God meant uh, for beauty. And then protection, uh, we see uh, rather than protecting one another through uh, our sexual union, <clears throat> we can at times use it for manipulation and control and things like that. The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus changes everything. So he doesn't change uh, God's design for sex or the gift of it, but um, what he does through his death and resurrection, he not only becomes the center of it, but he also is able to bring about some wholeness to where we've experienced brokenness. So Jesus, the resurrected Christ, after he's paid for our sin, comes back from the dead, he has victory over our sin and death, um, and then he offers us not only to receive that personally for the forgiveness of sin, but also to receive his work on our behalf for the fulfillment of our longings, life, intimacy, protection, um, pleasure. Those are all redemptive longings in every person's heart. And we're all looking for them at times in the wrong place. And Jesus is like, man, I fulfill your longings. Come to me. And so when we do that, then we're actually set free to enjoy the gift of sex the way he meant it to be enjoyed. Um, uh, he heals our brokenness. Many of you have brokenness. Um, there's shame. There's pain. There's all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, and Jesus, because he's overcome sin, because he's overcome death, because he took our shame, he's actually able to touch your shame. In ways that, that uh, nobody else has ever been able to and so we uh, invite him in to bring healing to places that we've never experienced healing before and uh, he redeems our identity so that we don't make too we don't over inflate it and we don't under inflate it and, and so what we see in this one is um, that our identity is not tied up in our sexuality our identity is is connected to Jesus and we've been made a son or a daughter of the God of the universe 
through his death and resurrection, and that's where our identity rests, and everything else is secondary to that. And so he redeems our identity from these lesser identities. And then uh, finally, he transforms our posture. Um, because this is all about Jesus, like it all points back to Jesus, the foundation of the discussion and the topic is about Jesus, it's made to worship Jesus. When we encounter people um, who, who disagree with us, who uh, come with brokenness or shame, whoever it might be, we're able to listen to, to value, um, to uh, under, have a greater understanding of where they're coming from, and uh, point them to the person and the work of Jesus. And, and so we don't compromise biblical truth, we don't, um, we don't lessen God's expectations and God's design of the gift, but we're able to take a posture where we can love people right where they are and continue to make the issue Jesus. Because Jesus is the greater issue than our sex or even our sexuality. He's the foundation of it. And so um, we make it about Jesus, we point people to Jesus, and when we find that people, whether it's us or whether it's people out there, are out of the design for what Jesus has uh, for, for sex and for sexuality, uh, then we're, uh, we're able to, in love, allow Jesus to bring about that transformation that only he can. So if, as we continue to make it more and more about Jesus, he's the one who has the power to bring change, to bring healing, to bring redemption. And so that's our encouragement, is to continue to bring that conversation and that topic back to the person of Jesus. Point them to him, point them to the biblical truths, and, uh, and do it in, in love and kindness. And so uh, hopefully uh, that, uh, that's something that encourages your heart and continues the dialogue. And uh, love you guys, and we'll see you next time.